Oh, your amazing grace, I've seen and tasted it. It's running through my veins. I can't escape its grip. In you, my soul is safe. You cover everything. Oh, your Yeah. 
seated. Have you ever gotten a song in your heart and it was the goodness of God and it just rang true in your heart, reminding you of truth and uh, just shattering all those doubts, shattering all those things? I love that it says, you know, even in the dark night, even in the, the darkest time, we can sing of the goodness of God. And guess what? When you can't sing of the goodness of God, it's all right. He's running after. His goodness is running after you and I'm glad we serve a Savior that runs after us, that we don't have to go dig and figure out and always wonder what our relationship is with Him, but He holds us secure. I appreciate that about our Savior today. It's good to see you. Um, Just one quick announcement outside of offering things. Uh, Just a reminder that our youth camp, our teen camp, is coming up July 28th, 29th, and 30th. Um, We'll have next week, it should be next week, we'll have some sign-ups and some forms for you to fill out for those of you who are interested. As we get closer, I'll have an informational meeting, so just call it maybe about two weeks from now. We'll have an informational meeting. I don't have a set date on that yet. For any parent or teenager that's um, interested in coming, just to kind of go over how that's going to go and how the day will go. So um, just be watching for those things. This week, we're praying for Mike Peters and his family. Uh, They're in Spain, and they're missionaries singing the goodness of God there and telling others about Jesus, and so let's keep them in our prayers. Um, and as, as we just go to the Lord in prayer. Just a few things. One, the children, uh, you are dismissed for Children's Church, and after I'm finished praying, uh, those of you who are taking offering, or while I'm praying, actually, those of you who are taking offering can work your way to the front. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, that you're a father to us, that, God, we, we celebrate you today just as we would any other day, but even we're reminded today how much of a, a father you are to us, how you watch over us. You're our shepherd and our father and our um, comforter. And Lord, we could just sit here and rattle many, many things that you are to us today. But God, we thank you uh, that you're a father to the fatherless and that you're in our lives the way that you are. And, and uh, God, we wouldn't be here. There would be nothing to us um, except for just a, a really just spiritually dead. Lord, we thank you that you've quickened our hearts. Lord, we, we um, pray for our missionaries in Spain. We pray for all of them. I think of today as Bob Caldwell is finishing up uh, his first week of Super Summer and starting another one. God, we just pray for him as he leads that effort out. God, that you would go uh, with him and just work through it. Lord, we pray for our offering here. Lord, we thank you for those. Uh, we thank you that you give us the ability to, to give. And God, that we might see more and more work happen here in Sullivan, Missouri. Thank you, Lord, that even though we may not uh, go to a foreign field, we have this area that we can pray for and work and and um, invite and tell others about you. And Lord, we just pray that you'd help us and empower us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
right there. We're going to start playing Name That Tune on Sunday morning. Anybody name it? Oh, you got it right off the bat. Anybody else know it? Shall We Gather at the River. It's an old gospel hymn. All right, Acts chapter 13 this morning. Acts chapter number 13. That was actually a great Father's Day song. Six days on the road, and I'm going to make it home tonight. Working hard, getting home to see the wife and kids. That is a Father's Day song if I ever heard one. Again, happy Father's Day to all you guys. I hope you're having a great weekend so far. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm always, and I, I'm not just saying this. Sometimes we just say stuff, but I usually don't just say stuff, and so I'm definitely not just saying this. Um, our church, uh, really specifically, uh, at least uh, in this context, our men just, just pleasantly surprise me all the time. Um, generally, throughout my history as a pastor, uh, Father's Day is one of the least attended services of the year, and that's always genuinely made me sad because Mother's Day is one of the highest days. You know, you can always count on a few things, you know, unless you're just kind of, and I'm not saying this critically, but unless you're going to a church that's kind of 10 or 15, 25, same people every week, you know, in a, in a growing church or a church that's reaching people, you can always kind of count Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day are going to be highly attended services. Now, I'm not saying Father's Day we knock it out of the park, attendance-wise. But it's definitely not one of those days that, that I look, look, look forward to thinking, man, this day's just going to stink, you know. All the guys are going to be on the river drinking beer and, you know, barbecue. Now, you might do that later. <laughs> but I appreciate the fact that as men, you've chosen to set an example to your family and, and be the spiritual leader. And, and I've always said, I think the reason why it turns out that way is, is just sort of what I implied a moment ago on Mother's Day. If you ask your mama, y'all are going to answer this for me. If you ask your mama, mama, what do you want for, for Mother's Day this year? <laughs> Honey, just come to church with me. That would make mama's day if you just come sit with me in church. Father's Day, dad, what do you want? Man, I want to, I want to unbutton the top button of my britches. I want to sit around and watch TV or, or go, to the, go to the river or sit at the park, whatever. It's, it's generally, I'm saying in most contexts, it's generally not Come sit with me in church. But you guys, again, I think our men deserve a round of applause because that's, a, that's admirable that, um, that you've chosen to, to set the pace and, and, and set the trajectory for your home. And I, I salute you for that. I respect you for it. Uh, Acts chapter number 13 is where we are this morning. So today will be as it has been. The last several chapters of the book of Acts <clears throat> has forced me to sort of slow down just a little bit and teach through it. Again, I could, I could just pull something out of each chapter and preach on that. In fact, in chapter 13, there's a lot of stuff that would be just sermon worthy. Uh, it'd be, it, would, it would merit an entire message, but, but I'm trying to give you the, the, whole, the whole spectrum of the book of Acts as we travel along through this series. So we're in chapter 13 today, and I'm going to walk you through it. Okay, I'm going to give you the, the snapshots, and then we'll summarize it in the conclusion. So begin reading with me in verse number 4. It says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> they, went out, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They also had John as their servant. Now that's, that's important. You might want to underline that or just make a mark next to it. In your Bible, actually not for today, but in the future, that's going to be an important statement. They also had John as their assistant. That's John Mark, verse number 6. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, and said, O oh, full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy, enemy of all righteousness, you will, not cease, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of 
the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and just simply ask in this moment, as by way of pause, just by way of reflection and, and, and understanding of who we are and what our need is, we submit our hearts before your throne. Father, we need you to, to speak to us. We desire to hear your voice. We desire to learn more of, of your word. We're thankful that you've given us a book that we can study, that we can dig into, that's timeless, that still applies just as much today to our lives as when the ink was wet on the parchment paper 2,000 years ago. I pray that you would continue to use us for your glory and honor. Please fill me with your spirit. Grant me wisdom to say everything that I ought to say. And Father, help me also to have the wisdom to not say some of the stupid stuff that I might be inclined to say. In Jesus' name, amen. And the second part of that prayer might be more important than the first. All right. So in Acts chapter 13, there, there are three scenes that, that ultimately tie together. Now to say that, that, that one chapter uh, ties together probably almost would, 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 would at least off the bat sound like a moot point because in reality, all scripture ought to tie together. But, but what I mean by that is, is I don't mean they just tie together historically, understanding that Acts is a history book, so there's a natural continuity in the book of Acts. But, but what we find here is a three-part buildup to three very precise and necessary concepts. So even though, again, historically there's just this natural historical record, this flow of the events that took place, we also find that there are three dynamic truths being conveyed in chapter 13. So scene number one, I want to walk through this with you. Acts chapter 13 begins with, with what is commonly known as Paul's first missionary journey. We're going to throw a map up on the screen for you. Um, this is the first time that the Apostle Paul uh, is officially sent out by the church to preach the gospel, make disciples, and plant churches throughout the region. So this is not the first time that the Apostle Paul has preached. It's not the first time he shared the gospel. It's not the first time he shared his testimony. This is, however, the first time he is officially sent out by the church to carry out the work of the ministry. I bought, brought with me this morning a laser pointer for my pleasure that's the only reason why I have this with me. So notice with me in verse number two in your Bibles that, uh, all right, verse two, it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So, so we see here in verse two that Paul and Barnabas are separated, they are distinguished for a particular purpose. Now this is important for us to understand that some individuals have a unique call on their life to do the work of the ministry. That calling is as unique as the individual himself or herself, right? We've, we've, we've sort of uh, designed these cookie cutter concepts of how ministry should be done. And, and we teach people that if you're going to do ministry, this is how it's done. This is how you should do it. You got to comb your hair this way. You got to wear this. You got to, you got to sing these types of songs. This is exactly how this is supposed to be done. But the beauty of God's calling is that the call is as unique as the person himself. God uses different types of people to carry out the work of the ministry. Paul and Barnabas were very different men. They are very unique, very distinct in their own right. We're going to discover later that that sometimes worked very well, and sometimes it didn't work out so well. And so, but, but, but the point is, God places a unique call on people's lives. Not all ministers look the same. They're not meant to look the same. Amen? And, and just because God calls certain people to ministry doesn't mean that there's, the, there's a greater than, less than sign. Everybody's equal in the kingdom. We understand that. But God does place a unique and special anointing on some people to carry out distinct works. And such was the case with Paul and Barnabas. Then in verses 4 through 6, we saw, see that Paul and Barn um, arrive in Salamis. Surely they had nicknames back then. You know what I'm saying? Like they couldn't have just always, hey, Barnabas. Barney, Barno, Barniferous. I'd have made up all kinds of stuff. But Paul and Barnabas arrive in Salamis. Okay, where is it? I lost it. Oh, it's down here in Cyprus. So they arrive in Salamis. See that? Again, no point really to that except to show you that I can use a laser pointer. And um, immediately they, they are met with opposition. The dude's name that opposes them is Bar-Jesus. Now, if that is not a pretentious name, I've never heard one. 
Anytime you see the word bar in front of a, a, a name in the Bible, when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, blessed art thou Simon bar Jonah, bar indicates son of. So the word bar always means son of. So his name bar Jesus means son of of Jesus or son of Joshua, which is the Hebrew form of Jesus, means son of Savior. Again, presumptuous guy, right? And, and he's described here in three ways. He's described as a sorcerer, he's described as a false prophet, and he's described as a Jew. So the Bible calls him a false prophet, the Bible calls him a sorcerer, and the Bible indicates that he's a Jew going by the surname of Jesus. Nowadays, we live in such sort of, sort of this, this milk toast form of Christianity, uh, that to, to even suggest that someone is a false teacher, uh, people say things like, well, that's divisive, you shouldn't say those things, who are you to judge? But, but the fact of the matter is, somebody's got to be willing to call a spade a, a spade. Not all things are equal. Not everybody that claims the name of Jesus is actually preaching the Jesus of the Bible. Not everyone who claims to be a gospel preacher is actually preaching the gospel of the Son of God. There are differences. And I know we want to pretend like everything's the same. We want to pretend like everything's equal. Well, they claim this. Well, that's fine. You can make a lot of claims. It's the substance that makes a difference. And so God meant no words. He said, this guy's a false teacher. He's a false prophet. He's a sorcerer. He's not working under the power of the Holy Spirit. There's definitely a spirit controlling him, but it's not my spirit. And he's going by the name Jesus, but he's not the son of Jesus. I can assure you of that. Okay, so here's what was happening. In verse number seven, we see that the Roman governor, a guy by the name of Sergius Paulus, again, we need a nickname for him, but Sergius Paulus desired to hear the gospel. Now, this is, this is intriguing because here's a nobleman, a highly esteemed individual, a guy of renown and rank, a Roman official. At this time, the Roman government was sort of divided and, and splintered off, and so they had, they had different regions that they would, they would place governors over. And so Sergius Paulus was the governor here, in Cyprus, okay? Are you guys impressed yet or what? Okay. I mean, if I hadn't done anything else to impress you, this ought to be impressive. I won't point it in your eyeball, by the way. Somebody reminded me I can put an eye out with this thing. So anyway, I don't know if that's true, but I'm not going to try it. So Sergius Paulus desires to hear the gospel. And then in verse number eight, the false prophet, whose, whose, whose name in Greek is Elimus, would have absolutely nothing to do with it. You say, why? Why would he be opposed to Paul and Barnabas preaching the gospel to Sergius Paulus? Well, the dude had made a pretty good living up until this point by teaching a false gospel, by teaching a false way. He was deceptive, he was dangerous, and Paul and Barnabas were threatening his, his, his cash cow, essentially, right? There's big money in mysticism, right? There's big money in it. There's big money in, 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 in pr promoting religion, promoting religious teaching, because inherently we all know that there's a God, we all know there's something out there besides us, we all know there's something greater than ourselves in this, in this universe. Con conceptually, logic teaches us that, common sense tells us there has to be something out there for us to have gotten here. And so there's big money. It's a big market. And so this Bar-Jesus guy, Elimus, was threatened by Paul and Barnabas. But now look at how the Apostle Paul handles the situation. He was always very tactful and gracious, okay, the Apostle Paul. In verse number 9, here's how he handles it, so tactfully and gracefully. Then it says, Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm glad that God uh, indicated specifically that Paul was not operating in his own volition, by his own will. This wasn't something that Paul did on a whim in a, in a fit of anger, okay? Here's what he said under inspiration, filled with the Holy Spirit. It says he looked intently at him. That means he looked him right in his eyeball and said, O fool of all deceit and fraud, you son of, a, son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. You will not cease, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Now again, inevitably, somebody's going to say, that's not very loving. That doesn't seem like something a Christian should do. Well, I guess really, if that's your mindset, it depends on who you're loving. For someone to say, to accuse Paul or someone like him, 
of calling out a false prophet and then turn around and say, well, I just don't feel like that's very Christian-like. I don't feel like that's very loving. It all depends on who you're loving. Because it's not very loving and it's not very Christ-like to sit on the sidelines doing nothing when someone's life is at stake either. It's not very loving. I can't sincerely love someone and yet stay silent while they're being abused and stay silent while they're being defrauded and be silent while they're being taken advantage of. Sometimes silence is golden and sometimes silence is just plain yellow. Amen? No cap. I'm just saying. That's for the young people. I just learned a new, I learned a new word this week. No cap means no lie. I'm not lying. All right, so no cap. It's, it's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to my children. I'm sorry to my wife. I apologize to everyone that I just embarrassed publicly. But nevertheless, it depends on who you love. I can't, I can't say I love someone. I can't say I love you and then stand by silently while someone takes advantage of you. I can't say that I love you and then stand by silently while someone abuses you or, 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 or poisons your heart and your mind with a, with a false gospel. That's not loving. And so when Paul made this statement, it wasn't because he hated Bar-Jesus or Elimus. It's because of his passion for the gospel, his love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that moment, his desire to see Sergius Paulus. Has anyone come up with a good nickname yet? All right, it was out of his desire to see old Sergio born again by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's decent. Can we go with that? All right, everybody vote on it. All in favor of Sergio, say aye. All opposed, just be quiet. We don't care. <laughs> so it was out of Paul's desire to see Sergius born again that he, you know, sometimes you do got to step up and get eyeball to eyeball with somebody. I've got no respect for a man who wouldn't defend his wife and children. That's not being unloving, that's just, that's just placing your love in the right arena. When you've dedicated yourself to love your wife and to love your children, I knew I'd turn this into a Father's Day message somehow, but when you've dedicated yourself to love your family, you've got to be willing to stand up and defend your family, you've got to be willing to provide for your family. It's unloving to sit by silently and let others take advantage of the ones that you claim to love. And so verse number 12, I'll... I'll sort of divert from that for just a moment. Verse number 12, uh, it says this, uh, not verse 12, but look, verse number 26. Uh, I'm sorry, no, it is verse 12. I'm on the wrong side of the page. Sorry, guys. <laughs> verse 12, it says, then the proconsul, that Sergius, believed. Sergius believed. He was saved. When he saw what had been done, being astonished by the teaching of the Lord. It's, 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 it's very interesting, I think, that the darkness that fell on the false prophet caused the light to shine in the life of Sergius. Now, here's a, here's a great truth, and most of us have experienced this on some level at least. Sometimes God has to expose a false teacher in your life in order for you to see the truth. Now, again, we've all at times most likely been duped by a false teacher on some level. I'm not saying not at the level of the gospel, but in some ways, God has had to unravel certain things in all of our hearts. To bring us to a point, we, we, you know, the popular term is deconstructing your faith. I'm not, I'm not promoting deconstructing your faith, but I am promoting deconstructing unbiblical teaching in your life. If you can't ask your leader, your teacher, your pastor, your preacher a question, let me just go ahead and tell you, that's a big red flag. I thought a few more than three would say yep on that. If, you, if you're following a pastor, if you're following a, a so-called spiritual leader, and that spiritual leader gets offended when you ask sincere questions, there's an issue with that. You say, well, I asked you a question one time, and you got ticked off about it. It's because your attitude stunk, all right? I'm just kidding. I don't, treat, I don't do that. At least I try not to. I try not to get annoyed. But, but there's an issue, right? And I'm not saying somebody who, there are what the Bible calls scoffers, people who just ask questions to be asking questions, those who question for the sake of questioning, those who are always just trying to trip people up. I ain't talking about that crowd. I ain't got time for that, right? You know, I'm not going to run in circles. But if you have a sincere question you want to know, you ought to be able to ask your spiritual leader. And if you can't without him being offended by that, then there's a problem. If what a man believes can't withstand the scrutiny of honest inquisition, you ought to question what he believes. And so, so God un, undid, undone, had undone, had undid, whatever. God had to undo the influence 
of this false prophet in the life of Sergius, Sergio, is that what we came up with? What? Was it Sergio? That's lame. We should have voted on a better name. But anyway, God had to undo the false teaching of, of, of Bar-Jesus in the life of Sergius Paulus in order for, for him to see the light of the gospel. And, and it's often through those seasons when God is, is bringing things to light in our lives, when he's, when he's sort of tearing down people that we've idolized. I think, think all of us, many of us, especially that come from religious backgrounds, have placed men and women oftentimes on pedestals and made almost demigods out of them. Like they were some level of humanity. Let me tell you, there's only one level of humanity, and there's only one God, and you ain't he, and I ain't he. All right? And I just use poor grammar to articulate the fact that I'm flawed, okay? It's the only reason why. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes God has to undo certain things in our lives for us to come to the point of the truth. Scene number two. Y'all ready? Scene number two takes place in verses 13 through 19. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna go through all that, but just to look on the map, they have now traveled. I wasn't ready for that, guys. Mapo, e mapo. All right, so they have now traveled. Here's the cool laser pointer again. From the island of Cyprus north to Antioch in Pisidia. And this is actually the only reason why I brought the map out. Because do you notice over here? What's that say? For those of you that can see. Antioch. So they were called Christians first where? In Antioch. So I wanted to make sure you knew there's a difference between Antioch over here and Antioch, Antioch in Syria and Antioch in Pisidia. They've traveled north to Antioch of Pisidia. And in verse number 15, uh, read this with me. In verse 15, it says, after the reading of the law, where are they now? Okay, make sure we're still together. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So now in verse 15, Paul and Barnabas are in the synagogue for the weekly reading of the law and prophets. So every week in the synagogues, they still do this on the Sabbath day, every week in the synagogues, they read a portion and it's, it's an allotted portion. It's already mapped out. It's on the calendar that they read this passage the same day every year. And so they go in and they sit down and they have the reading of the law and the prophets, but something peculiar takes place when, when they finish the reading, the rabbi who is, who is overseeing the, the gathering that day uh, opens the floor for the apostles to speak. Now that was unheard of. It wasn't like they didn't know. It wasn't like this rabbi thought these guys were, were other Jewish teachers. They knew about Paul and Barnabas. They knew about this church at Antioch. These, these are earth shakers, right? These guys have already turned the world upside down, and their reputation preceded them. So, so for, for the simple fact that this rabbi got done reading from the law and the prophets that day and then looked at Paul and Barnabas and said, hey, if you've got anything to share, would you share it with us? That was phenomenal, Right? And so, so, so when he gives them the floor, Paul begins with the story of the Exodus. In verse number 17, he says, The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. So he begins with this, this, the Exodus story and how God powerfully and majestically brought them out of bondage. But I want to particularly draw your attention to the phrase in verse number 18 where he says, for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of the Exodus, then allow me to sort of summarize it. God had brought his people who were in Egyptian bondage. I won't go all the way back to the time of, of Jacob and Isaac and all the patriarchs, but, but just to fast forward to the time of Exodus, the Exodus, God brought his people through Moses out of bondage. They had been slaves in Egypt for over 400 years, and now God sends a deliverer, Moses, to bring them out of bondage. He works many miracles. He sends the plagues into Egypt. He has to put Pharaoh's arm behind his back effectively to, to, uh, to for Pharaoh to finally release the people of God, the people of Israel. And so God, God set them free from bondage, leads them out by way of the wilderness, crosses the Red Sea on dry ground. You know all the story, right? You've seen the movie if you haven't read the book, I'm sure. And so he, he, he leads them out by way of the Red Sea. They cross the Red Sea on dry ground. And, and then it says for a time of about 40 years, God put up 
with their ways in the wilderness. Well, we, we also know because of the story that's recorded in the book of Exodus that, that the Jews did some ridiculously stupid things in the, in the wilderness. I mean, ridiculously stupid things. You think you've made some bad decisions. They, they worshiped a golden calf while Moses was on the mountain communicating with God, receiving the Ten Commandments. They're at the base of the mountain making a golden calf and worshiping it, dancing, the Bible says, naked. You can't make this stuff up. Dancing naked around a golden calf. That's stupid, in case you need somebody to say that bluntly. That's just stupid. They had witnessed God do amazing things. You know the stories, the miracles. If nothing else, think about this. If nothing else, if there were not the ten plagues in Egypt, if Moses' walking stick hadn't turned into a serpent, God parted the Red Sea in front of their very eyes. Now, you would think for the rest of their lives, they'd go, you know what? I ain't worshiping anybody but him. I'm committed. Put my name in the books. Right? But just a short period of time later, there's not really a lot of time chronologically that transpired from the Red Sea crossing to Mount Sinai where they're now dancing naked, probably doing more than that, around a golden calf in the wilderness. They did a lot of stupid things. They griped about the fact that they weren't in Egypt anymore. Think about that. They were slaves in Egypt. Now, last time I checked, not many people are filling out their resumes or putting in an application to be a slave. They were slaves in Egypt. They weren't treated very well. And yet in the wilderness, they sat there and they thought back to when they were in Egypt and said, boy, I just, yeah, I wish old Moses would just left us alone. You know, it wasn't so bad. They fed us sometimes, right? They complained about the food that God did provide. God provided them manna to eat in the wilderness, which was awesome in the beginning, but then they got sick of it. Too bad they weren't like my kids. My little kids can eat the same thing every day and be just fine. But they complained about the food that God provided for them. And so when we, so when we read the statement, that's just giving you a snippet, but when we read the statement, verse number 18, that, that God put up with their ways in the wilderness, I can't help but ask the question, why did God put up with their bull? Get it? Golden calf, bull? Come on now, that's good comedy. Why did God put up with their bull in the wilderness? Well, here's the answer to that. Number one, because he knew what he knew. He knew they were going somewhere. He knew that this time wasn't wasted. He knew that he had a purpose and a plan. So if we ask the question, why did God put up with their nonsense in the wilderness for 40 years? Why didn't he just wipe them out and start over? Well, because he knew what he knew. The Bible tells us God sees the end from the beginning. This sort of, you know, is mind-boggling, but, but we serve a God who doesn't dwell in, the, in, a, in a time cap, so God is not confined by time, space, or matter. And so when we think about God and we consider the omnipresence of God, omnipresence does, doesn't just mean that he's geographically everywhere at one time. It means that he is also in time everywhere at one time. That means God's still yesterday, and he's already tomorrow. And he's already present 10,000 years from now. And so God understands every step that we take. He already abides. He already consumes what we haven't yet experienced because he's an omnipresent, all-knowing God. So when we think about why would would God be so patient? I'm a human being and there's no way I could be that patient with people. How could God be so patient for 40 years with people who did nothing but backbite and complain and bellyache, and it seemed like no matter how much he did for them, they never were satisfied. How did God put up with that? Well, he put up with that because he knew what he knew. And then number two, he put up with it because he knew that they did not know what he knew. This ought to be comforting at some point. Because the same God that put up with their bull puts up with your bull. So how did God put up with their wanderings, their their, their fickle attitudes and behaviors? How did God deal with that for 40 years? Well, he knew what he knew, but he also knew that they didn't know what he knew. He understood their limitations. He understood their frustrations. He understood their fears. He knew that this was painful and yet a necessary process and that the process did not make sense to them at the time. If you'll even flip to the maps part of your Bible... You don't have to do it now. 
But if you'll even flip to the maps in your Bible and look at the map that's titled the Exodus, and you follow the route that God took them on from Egypt to Canaan, from Egypt to Jericho, it makes no sense. If you try to follow the map, I'm telling you, I should have thrown that on the screen because you guys are so impressed, not really, with my laser pointer. Really expected more excitement over that. But if you'll follow the map of the Exodus, there's, you could have drawn a straight line from Egypt to Jericho. And yet God took them south, and then north, and then south, and then east, and then south, and then northwest. I mean, it's crazy. It didn't make sense on paper. Nothing calculated. When they, when, they, when they tried to stand back and logically reason out what God was doing in their lives, they couldn't understand it. Now, here's the beauty about God. He might lead us in paths that we don't understand. He might, he might bring things into our lives that we look at and we say, you know, that just doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make sense that I went from here to here, from this relationship to that relationship, this job to that job, this, this house to that house. I can't, I can't compute this. It doesn't make any sense. And, and, and God was patient with them just as he's patient with us because not only does he know what he knows, he knows what you don't know. Which is why I said last week, if you have questions, ask him. It's, it's foolhardy for people to say, don't ever question God. You should never question God. Do you really think God is that insecure? Do you really think that God is so insecure that if I come to him as one of his children, brokenhearted, confused, fearful, and say, Father, I just don't understand why you let this happen. Do you think God's really going to look at me and go, shut your mouth, boy, just do what I told you? Do you think God's that insecure? Do you think he's that threatened by our questions? I think God wants us to ask questions. We may not always get the answers that we're looking for. We may not fully understand still because there are things that we just simply can't see with these eyes. But God was patient with them in the wilderness because he knew that they didn't know what he knew. And nothing made sense on paper and he knew that. Here's here's the wonderful thing about God. He's even more practical than you are. Sometimes we act like practicality and spirituality can't co-abide. But the truth of the matter is the Bible's chock full of pragmatic, practical truth. But not everything is going to shake out in the moment. And not everything is going to make sense to you right here and right now. Which is why the Bible clearly says we now look through a glass darkly we are viewing the future with blinders on we can sort of maybe see a few things and when you serve the lord for a while and learn some biblical concepts and principles you might start to be able to see a little bit down the road better than you could before but the truth is no matter how spiritual you are or how well versed you are in the scriptures there are still things down the road that you can't quite figure out yet and there are things that have happened in your life that still don't make sense But God understands that you don't understand, and I love the passage of Scripture in the Bible in the book of Psalms where David said he knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. We need to remember that ourselves sometimes. Sometimes we need to be reminded that we're just made out of mud. We're just clay. We're just just fragile vessels of clay. And God remembers that, and God understands that, and God knows our weaknesses. This isn't an excuse to continue making bad decisions and stupid choices, but it is the fact of the matter that still remains. God knows who we are, he knows where we are, and he knows we don't know what he knows. That's a beautiful truth. I don't know if you're just really absorbing it and contemplating it, if you're going, Dad gum, dude, this is boring, please move on. I'm not sure what's going on yet, but that's a dynamite truth. That God knows what he knows, and he knows what we don't know. And then Paul ties all of the Old Testament together in verses 26 through 39 by preaching Jesus. Now, I'm not going to read all those verses. You can thank me later, okay? But in verses 26 through 39, uh, he he really brings it all together by preaching Christ. Let's do read verse 26. Notice this. Here's what he said, all right? He gave them the story of the Exodus, the prophets, up through the judges, up through the times of the kings, through David, and now he comes to verse number 26, and he says, men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, 
and those among you who fear God. To you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. In other words, those, 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 those people that the prophets prophesied about are you. Y'all are the ones who condemned the Son of God, and you don't even see it. You're still sitting every week in your, in your synagogues on the Sabbath day, listening to the words of the prophets, and he says, the words of the prophets have been fulfilled. Verse 28, and though they found no cause of death for him, talking about Jesus, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead. So now here's the beauty of this whole story, this whole saga that has unfolded. Paul says, look guys, it was all about Jesus to begin with. All of this story, it wasn't about Moses, it wasn't about the people of Israel, it wasn't about Pharaoh, it was about the fact that there's a war that's been waging since the dawn of time between good and evil, between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, and Moses was just a man that God used as a type for the one who would one day come and deliver you from bondage. It wasn't about Moses, and it wasn't about Egypt, and it wasn't about Israel, it was about the fact that one day God himself would send a savior to set men free from their sins. And, it, and Egypt was just a type and a picture and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, an, and an arena for him to display his majesty and his glory and his redemptive beauty. And so here's where it all ties together. Scene number three in verse number 42. Y'all ready for this? Well, if you're not, it's coming down the pike anyhow. <laughs> verse 42 is where we, we segue into scene number three of Acts chapter number 13. It says that, that in verse 42, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now we're going to read on in just a moment, but it's important to point this out. The Bible says that the gospel would go to the Jew first, to the Jew first. The gospel began with the nation of Israel. Jesus was a Jew. Now, I'm sorry for those of you who have a white, blue-eyed, brown-haired Jesus on a cross in your home, not being offensive, but he was a thoroughbred Jew. He, went to, he, he was born of the nation of Israel. Humanly speaking, Jesus' mama, Mary, was 100% Jew. Now, the good news is his daddy was 100% God, but Jesus was born into the nation of Israel. And so the, the gospel was sent to the Jews first, but now watch this transition. You, you remember I told you that we're in this, this period, this shifting dispensation in the book of Acts, where, where the focus not only is, is, is segueing from the apostle Peter, Simon Peter, to the apostle Paul, you're going to see Simon Peter fade off into the shadows. What you're also going to see, who you're also going to see fade off into the shadows is the nation of Israel. Not because God has cast away his people. God, Paul clarified that in Romans chapter 9. God hasn't thrown his people aside. He hasn't cast away the nation of Israel. But he gave them the opportunity first to receive their Messiah, to receive their Savior, to receive the gospel, and they rejected it. So, so there's, this, there's this beautiful story that unfolds here in Antioch in Pisidia that is that, that God sent the gospel to the synagogues first. The apostles went into the synagogues and preached Jesus. But the Jews wholesale said as they said when, when Pilate brought Jesus and Barabbas out before them, he said, who do you want? Do you want me to release Jesus or Barabbas? The Jews cried out with one accord saying, give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. And they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Now, that's a dangerous statement. The Jews as a whole voted and said, let his blood, Jesus' blood, we don't want him. That's not the kind of savior we're looking for. That's not the leader we're desiring. We want a governmental leader. We want a king that will set us free and make all of our problems on earth go away. We're not, we're not concerned for eternity or spiritual things. So let his blood be on us and on our children. And then God in his mercy still just kept pressing the gospel into the nation of Israel. Just kept shining light 
and shedding truth into their hearts, and they continually push the gospel aside and push the truth aside. But, but here's a beautiful thing that unfolds in Pisidia. It says that, that when, they, when, the, when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles, our folks, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And and in verse 43, when the congregation had broken up and many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified God or glorified the word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So here's where this whole story comes together. Y'all got five more minutes. You got 10 more minutes. You got 15 more minutes. Let me give you just a few thoughts real quick and we're done. Number one, scene one teaches us that there can only be one true gospel. Amen. If I have to tell y'all when to amen, you know how this is. It just takes longer. (laughs) Scene one reveals to us that there can only be one true gospel. You remember Bar Jesus? Remember that guy? False prophet. Teaching a false gospel. Presenting a false concept of who God is. And so that story teaches us that there can only be one true gospel. The Apostle Paul, again, the same guy that rebuked him and said, look, you're a son of the devil. You're a son of a gun, son of a gun. Get on out of here. That's what I was trying to say. It's bad when a redneck gets tripped up on redneck words. He said, you got got to shut your mouth. You're preaching a false gospel. He rebuked him. Now, here's what that same apostle, Paul, would go on to write later in Galatians chapter number one. If you're in my Wednesday night study, we've already covered this. But here's what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter one, verse six. He said, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. He said, it ain't a different gospel. There's only one gospel. But there, 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 there's this stuff that gets packaged up and called the gospel. He said, and it's amazing to me how quickly people will believe anything but the truth. He said, I marvel, I'm blown away that you, would, that you would turn aside to another gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you. See that? And want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you, then what you have received let him be accursed. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Paul said there is only one gospel. Now again, I know this isn't popular, but all roads don't lead to heaven. People say, well, I just think if you know you do your best and you, you know, you try to do good things and you be re- you be religious and you know you do the best you can. All, you know, honestly, even that thought process is fa- is a false gospel. Even the even the thinking that that because I'm doing some good stuff and man, I'm not as bad as everybody else, and I might not be perfect, but I'm doing okay. I'm batting at least three and a quarter. You know what I'm saying? I'm not as bad as everybody. I'm not as bad as... That mindset is a false gospel. It's a false dichotomy. You're looking at other people in the world saying, I'm not as bad as him. That's not the problem. The problem is that you're not perfect. The problem is that you are broken. The problem is that you do have a sin nature. The problem is that you have made some fundamentally poor decisions in your life in the presence of God. And the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are upon every person beholding the evil and the good. I'm glad God's seen my good days, but unfortunately he has seen my bad days as well. And so we all need a redeemer. 
We all need a Savior. There's none good, no, not one. None of, us are, none of us is perfect. None of us can be perfect. We have to understand that. And there's only one gospel. This isn't, this isn't for the sake of being divisive. This isn't for the sake of saying, man, you know, this church is the best church ever. There ain't no other church like it. That is all true. But it's not just for the sake of saying that. It's really not. I'm not saying this is the only church that preaches the gospel. It's absolutely not. I can name a dozen churches within, within 4,000 miles of here. <laughs> no, I can, I, can name, I can name dozens of churches within, within driving distance that I would say, man, I don't agree with everything they do. I actually don't agree with everything they teach. I may not like the way they do it, but they preach Christ. They preach the true gospel. I have no problem with that. You understand this isn't being divisive. This is the difference between telling somebody that, oh yeah, everything's fine. Can you imagine a doctor seeing your life under an MRI and you're completely ate up with, with, with a disease? You're in stage four of, of a debilitating, life-threatening disease and that doctor pats you on the back and says, man, you know, yeah, have a good day. Make sure you put your copay in out there when you're leaving. What kind of doctor would do something like that? What kind of preacher would stand up and act like all roads lead to heaven? Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. He even went on to say later, if there had been a law, if I could have given you principles, if I could have given you a law, if I could have created a religion that would have remedied the problem of the human heart, I would have done that. I would have given you a formula. I would have given you a checklist. I would have given you a little wafer you could drink or some juice you could or a wafer you could eat, or some juice you could drink, or I'd have done that if it were possible. But, but, the, but the reality of our, of our depravity, the reality of the human nature is that, that it's not possible for us to attain up to the glory and the presence of a holy God. And so the only solution in the foreknowledge of God through the perfect plan of God, through the predeterminate will of God, was that one day God himself would become a lamb for the sacrifice, that he would take upon him the sins of the world, that he would die the propitiation, propitiationary death for our sins, that he would stand in our place and purchase our redemption with his own blood. And now, through faith in Christ, we are the sons and the daughters of God, and we've been made perfectly right in the sight of God, not because of our good works, not because of our religion, not because somehow we've turned over a new leaf, but because we've placed our faith in the perfect Lamb of God. He has, he has exonerated our record. He has made us perfectly right in the sight of the Father, and now we've been redeemed through Jesus. There is only one gospel. Which means that a false gospel has to be identified. You have to realize that not all roads lead to heaven. You're not saved because of your baptism. You're not saved because of your religion. You're not saved because of your sacraments. It's through faith and faith alone in Jesus and Jesus alone that saves the human soul from a Christless eternity. We have to trust Jesus. There's only one way. That's why the Bible says, for by grace you're saved. Through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, and it's not of works lest anyone should boast. In other words, we're not going to get to heaven and go, Woo, George, good to see you, man. Glad you made it. Attaboy. Attaboy. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job, guys. You get a ribbon. You get a ribbon. We all did it. Nobody's going to boast. Nobody's going to brag. I'm not going to walk the streets of gold and say, I told y'all. <laughs> you didn't think that I could do it. But here I am, mansion, pearly gates, streets of gold, <laughs> I did it. No, in fact, the very first thing you see in the book of Revelation when God gave John a glimpse of heaven, Revelation chapter 4, John said, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. <laughs> and I heard, as it were, the voice of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up here. And he said, when I beheld that vision, when I beheld that place, when I beheld that celestial land, the very first thing he saw was he said, I saw a throne and one seated on it whose face was brighter than the sun. And I heard the voice of 10,000s of angels crying, worthy is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. I'm telling you, our song in heaven will not be, look what I've done. It's going to be all, look what he did to get me here. It's all about the lamb. It's all about Jesus. It's all about his blood. There is only one gospel. There can only be one gospel. Not all gospels, not, all, not everything that claims to be the gospel is the same. 
Paul said, somebody preaches another gospel. You say, well, what's another gospel? If you add to the gospel, that's another gospel. Again, I'm, I'm the first one to stand up. I, I, I might be the only, probably not, but I may be the only preacher you'll ever hear that'll, that'll be honest enough to tell you there are some things in the Bible that are, that are a little, eh, I don't know, debatable. You guys okay? <laughs> I'm not arrogant enough to think I've got it all figured out, I promise you. I'm not. There's stuff I study every day of my life that I'm still going, man, I just, that's tough. I can see this side, I can see that side right? But when, I, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the gospel, the, the salvation of the never dying soul of man, when it comes to that, l- let, me, let me be very clear. God has made this a black and white issue. There is absolutely no gray area. There's absolutely no room for debate. This, in fact, is the only subject that you'll ever find anywhere in the Bible that the Bible says if anybody teaches anything other than this, let them be damned. Paul even said, let, if, you hear, if you hear old Paul preach another gospel 10 years from now, if I circle back around and I come back up in here and I have gotten corrupted in my mind and, and started teaching a false gospel, he said, you go ahead and just mark it down. Let me be accursed. Because there's one gospel, and that gospel is so black and white that the, the, the same guy, The Apostle Paul, now Jesus said it too, but the Apostle Paul put it in such plain language. He said the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. That is the gospel. And so if you add to that, it's a false gospel. If you say, well, it's, it's what Jesus did for us on the cross, it's his, it's his bodily you know, resurrection, it's, that's, the, it, that's the gospel, but you also have to. If that also have to, it just became a false gospel. And if you take away from it, it's a false gospel. It's Jesus plus nothing minus nothing. It's that he died for our sins, it's that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day for our justification. That's the gospel. And there's no gray area. It's black and white. That is not a debatable biblical subject. It's very clear. And I would challenge anybody on that subject. Now, you can argue with me about other topics. We can discuss eschatology. We can discuss prophecy. We can discuss the manifestation of the Spirit. There's a lot of stuff we can discuss, and I'll go, yeah, I see that. I don't agree with it, but I see your point. You start bringing another gospel to me, I ain't seeing it. I ain't hearing it. Because it's wrong. There is one way, there is one truth, there is one life, and it's not a what, it's a who, and his name is Jesus Christ. Scene number two. (laughs) Scene two, and I'll I'll hit these really fast. You said you had 25 minutes a minute ago. (laughs) That's what I heard. Scene two teaches us, you remember what scene two is? I'm sure you were taking notes. Scene two is where he talked about the wilderness wanderings. Here's what I want to say to you about scene two. Your wilderness will not be wasted. We all go through those wilderness seasons of our lives where God's done a mighty work and then all of a sudden, man, it's like, where'd God go? I saw him working over here. I witnessed his majesty. There's no doubt he was doing something in my heart. He was doing something in my life right here. And you might have even witnessed some miracles, but we'll all go through those seasons where it seems like God's just being quiet. And we're calling and we're crying and we're praying and we're hollering out and we're doing what we know to do and it seems like heaven's silent. Well, just remember this, God knows what he knows and God knows you don't know what he knows, but your wilderness seasons will never be wasted unless you waste it. Because God is always doing something in our lives. Now, a lot of the people of Israel wasted that season. A lot of them threw it away. Because they gave up when they couldn't understand, they threw in the towel. I'm begging you, don't throw in the towel even when you can't see what God's doing. Know that God is at work, and he's not going to waste your wilderness. And then number three, I'm finished. I told you these last two would be fast. Number three, scene number three teaches us that you are your own judge. That's a heavy statement, but it's a true statement. Read verse 46 with me again, and read it very carefully. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. 
but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, we turn to the Gentiles. Can I share a very deep truth with you? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know who Jesus wants to save? Absolutely everybody. Absolutely everybody. Every human soul that's ever breathed air on the face of the planet, Jesus desires to save. But here's what Jesus also said. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. By your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. You say, well, I don't think any man should judge me. Oh, we won't. We won't. I'm going to be real technical with you. It's going to sound like you're going to want to stone me as a false prophet, but then I'm going to qualify what I'm about to say, but God's not even going to judge you. You will stand before God as judge, but it'll be your words that condemn you if you die without Christ. Do you know why? It's very simple. The Bible says with the mouth, Confession is made to salvation. God made being saved so easy that if you're breathing, you can call on the name of Jesus Christ. And here's another controversial one. I, don't, I hope you don't do this, but even on a person's deathbed, if, they're, if, if your mind is still cognitive, if you can still process thought, and you call on Jesus on your deathbed, he will still save you. The thief on the cross died in the 11th hour of his life. So you fight me on that issue all you want to. But as long as you, are, you have a cognitive thought in your mind and you are willing and able to call in the name of Jesus Christ. Now there's the big question is if you're willing. Because the condemnation that fell on the, on the people there in Antioch of Pisidio is he said, you know what? You've judged yourselves unworthy. The same gospel was preached to you. The same Jesus was preached to you. The same message was presented. And yet you said no. And so you have judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Don't point toward heaven and act like God hasn't been good to you. Don't point toward heaven and act like God hasn't given you ample opportunity. Don't you criticize and judge God because you're judging yourselves. Now, you may not agree with everything that I'm telling you this morning, but I'm telling you, when we stand before God, if, we, if a person hasn't been saved, it's not because Jesus didn't give you the opportunity. You can be saved right here, right now, where you stand, where you sit. You can come up here and ask questions. We'll answer questions without criticism, without judgment. You're in the least judgmental church you'll probably ever walk into. And if you find somebody in this church that's judgmental, point them out to me, and I will be judgmental toward them, just to show them. But there's absolutely nothing in this moment, right here, right now. If in your heart you know, you know that you've never really trusted Jesus as your Savior, and I'm here to tell you by way of testimony and by way of experience that when that's you, God makes it abundantly clear. There was one thing I, I, that I knew as a 19-year-old boy burnt out on drugs. When the Spirit of God began to deal with me, there was not a question in my mind what I needed to do. I knew I was lost. I knew that I'd never trusted Jesus as my Savior. I knew I'd gone through the motions and I'd been baptized and did the little churchy church thing when I was a kid, but I knew in my heart it was never real. And so if you're sitting here today and the Spirit of God is dealing with you, I promise He's not asking questions, He's making statements. And in this moment, you know in your heart that you're not saved and and all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus Christ. Prove me wrong. Call on Him. Trust in Him as Savior. And I promise you because he promised you, those who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. If you'll call on him, he'll save you today. If you'll put your faith in him. Let's stand together.
If you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior, the ball is in your court. It's your time. It's your choice. It's your decision to make. While the Spirit is calling you and dealing with your heart, this is your moment. This is your time. And all of God's people, trust me, believe the Word of God. Your wilderness will not be wasted. God is doing a work in your life, and He will fulfill it. He'll perform it. He'll finish the work. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for your blessing on this time of reflection. And now, Lord, we ask specifically, if there's someone here today under the sound of my voice who does not know Christ as his or her Savior, that they would settle that right here, right now, between you and them. Help them to settle it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm living proof of what the mercy of God can do. If you knew me then, you'd believe me now. He turned my whole life upside down, took the old. on what I've done but His goodness and mercy and the power of the blood I thought I